Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but struggling to find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Athena Health is looking for a senior product designer in Austin, Texas. Underbelly is looking for a product design director in Salt Lake City, Utah. And if you're looking for remote work, Uber is looking for a product designer for the Uber Freight team. Companies, stop making excuses on your D&I efforts and post your job listings with us. For just $99, your listing will be on our job board for 30 days, and we'll spread the word for you about your job to our diverse audience of listeners. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more info on these listings. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Revision Path. Thank you again so much for tuning in this week. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. And this week, I'm talking with Denver-based strategist and illustrator Shayla Hunter, creator of the 100 Black Females Project. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Shayla Hunter, and I am a strategist and also an illustrator and a creator of the 100 Black Females Project. Nice. Now, one thing that I've been asking everyone, and I'm sure for folks that have listened to the show, they know this, but I'm always kind of doing this like COVID-19 check-in just to kind of see where people are at. So how are you holding up right now during the pandemic? Yeah, so holding up pretty well. We're just at the at August 2nd. Yeah, it's kind of wild that it's been this long, but I'm doing pretty well. I think that, you know, in the beginning, in, in late March into April and there was a lot going on, obviously, and it was a, a day by day and, you know, it was kind of in my apartment <laughs> and trying to take walks outside and be away from people. And I'm still doing all of that. But I feel as though now that it's been, we've been into summer, kind of have a little bit more to, uh, can be outside a lot more and things like that. So I'm holding up okay. <laughs> yeah. Denver is really nice in the summer too. I, I went there. Was it last summer? I think it was last summer I was in Denver. For some reason, I was surprised at how hot it was. But then it makes sense because it's the Mile High City, so it's closer to the sun. Yes. Yes. (laughs) This one is intense. (laughs) I was like, this is Atlanta heat. I've not expected this. (laughs) (laughs) It is intense. and But I must say the fact that I forget, it's not sunny 365 days a year, but it's like, sunny 350 days you know it's something like that like so yeah. there's, there's, it's it's sunny all the time so even in the winter time when it's it's cold out it's nice to have the sun as well because it doesn't really feel like a dreary long winter yeah. <laughs> as in the east coast so let's uh, talk about your work that you're doing at uh, egg strategy like what are your work days looking like right now yeah. So X Strategy is a marketing research and strategy consultancy. And so, you know, we work with a lot of clients across lifestyle, consumer packaged goods. So that means things that you find on the shelves and the grocery stores and things like that. And then also health brands as well um, and companies. So right now we've been really busy and doing a lot of work with our clients that we've had and new clients. I work work really well amongst my amongst my colleagues you know we've been with it within the pandemic i feel as though the transition has been fairly easy for us and when i say that it's just because we have three offices so there's one in chicago in denver and in new york and we work in you know in teams amongst one another you know across the the three offices and then there's you know people who are sometimes in other places as well so As a team, as a company, I felt like that we work really well already, kind of virtually. And so it was a pretty sort of easy transition into kind of going full on and and that sort of thing. So 
as of late, you know, we've been kind of working on different projects and it's it's been going going pretty well. So can't, you know, no complaints. <laughs> Has it been harder kind of navigating with the team throughout this because you're now all working remotely? No, I don't think so. You know, like I said, you know, because we have we've been kind of working remote already and in a sense because we have three offices and everyone, you know, we we keep very well connected through video chats and calls and all types of things. So, I think it's been it's been a pretty pretty well done transition, I must say. Okay. What kinds of projects are you working on now? You mentioned like doing package goods, health. How does your work as a strategist kind of fall within this consultancy? Yeah. So, you know, we, clients will come to us, they have different challenges, things that they're looking to do to improve their business. So that could be way, ways that they're communicating to their, to consumers or how they're trying to, you know, innovate or share a new product. And so we kind of, they come to us and they're like, Hey, you know, we need help. Can you help guide us to doing this the, the right way? You know, what's the strategy? And so a lot of times, you know, we're, we really get deep into research and talking to consumers and, you know, doing interviews and focus groups and things like that to really kind of hear from them what's going on, see what the pulse is, see what's going on, you know, looking at everything from culture to, to changes, you know, within industries and things like that. So we take all of that information and, you know, look at what are the main um, key themes and insights that we're hearing and then, um, you know, put present that to our clients so that they can put that into action. So it's, it's kind of everything from, you know, like I said, from those, from those three industries and, and beyond. So. That's interesting. It's almost, uh, maybe this is a weird analogy, but it almost sounds like a detective agency. <laughs> like a client comes to you, like they've got this big problem they need solving and you do the legwork and the research to kind of come up with, like the solution to their problem, essentially. That might be a weird analogy. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I mean, I think all, detect- all detectives are researchers, right? So, so yeah, I guess you could say we are sort of um, detectives in a sense. But, you know, it is a lot of kind of getting research, but then also looking out for the things that that aren't st- sticking right in your face, you know, kind of yeah. those little, those aha moments and those surprises and, and things like that. And, and kind of helping clients find what those things are and then helping them navigate it from, from there. How did you first get started there? So I, when I, I moved here just about two years ago from New York city and, you know, I was really pounding the pavement and trying to, because I was switching industries. So I was really trying to get into doing brand strategy and, you know, was meeting and working with, you know, trying to do some freelance work for people and things like that. And just kind of started doing coffees and with, with people and reaching out to people who were, who were within sort of branding and, and uh, strategy and um, advertising and things like that, that were here. And someone who I met with, she knew someone <laughs> at Egg. And when there was a position that was open, she was like, hey, I think you should talk to them. They're really great. And yeah, and then the rest was history. Wow. So you kind of did it like, I don't want to say the old fashioned way, but <laughs> like you, you moved to a new city and you really went and like met people and talk to them and had meetings to kind of figure out what it is that you wanted to do, which honestly, during this pandemic sounds like a fantasy at this point because everything is so virtual. But no, that's that's cool that you were able to to find something just by doing that kind of networking, especially in like a totally new city. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely hard even pre-pandemic because you know, you can reach out to a lot of people cold emailing that type of thing or trying to find, you know, a connection on LinkedIn, hey, you know, my friend and or an old colleague, that kind of thing and it can be difficult because everyone's busy you know, sometimes some people are more responsive than others. So, you know, you kind of don't want to take it, take it all to heart if you don't hear back from someone. So, you know, you just kind of like put it out there, see what happens. You know, if if you reach out to 50, you might hear back from three and that's what it is. (laughs) And then you just kind of go from there. Yeah. Now, before your work at Egg, you, you know, sort of alluded to it earlier that you worked uh, in New York City. 
or you, mm-hmm. you came from New York City, but you worked there as a visual content director for Time Inc., which uh, most notably you were working with Fortune Magazine and with Money Magazine. And you were there for a long time, mm-hmm. for seven years, right? Yes, yes. I was there for seven years. And the bulk of my time was with money. And then there were some transitions at the time where they were kind of moving some things around within the company. And then I and then I was pulled in to do money and fortune um, in my last year there. And now, you know, it's formally Time Inc. Now it's called Meredith and Money Magazine is no longer there. And I believe Fortune has kind of shifted into its own entity as well. So there's been a lot of changes since I left. But uh, but yeah, I was there for seven years and it was a great time. And, uh, you know, worked and worked with a, with a very talented group of people. What did you really like learn during that time? I mean, seven years in the publishing industry, especially with the Internet, kind of seems like that's a long time. <laughs> Yes. You know, I think that from the beginning when I first started at at Money and I was, there was kind of like we were hearing little, not hearing, but you know, the internet was already, you know, whatever. The internet was around, right? But we were hearing kind of things where it was like, okay, how are we going to do a website? Let's transition into bringing more content online. And how can we kind of keep this going? Because the publishing industry was hurting for some time. So, you know, I kind of, just continued to bring my expertise that I had from, you know, prior positions and things that I did and just kind of continued to kind of shift my mind from, you know, okay, we're creating this for print, but what can we do to make this just as interesting for online? Or what can we do on Instagram to make this just as interesting and and pulling people in? So yeah, it was a constant sort of shift and exploration that that we as the creatives and the editors and things like that, that we were all doing to kind of continue to, to make the brand just as strong. Yeah. There's this weird, uh, and maybe it's because I've been around on the web for a long time, but like there's this weird symbiotic relationship between like blogging and magazines and publishing, like how they all kind of work together. Cause it's all essentially a similar type of thing. You're publishing information to an audience, but it's funny now how like a lot of people who are well-known columnists now, or like that worked in magazines now sort of got their early start just blogging, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so I'm just curious about like how that, that time was because with blogs kind of taking over for some publications or some publications now moving online to kind of compete with the fact that so many people can now just publish using like WordPress or something, what that was like being in the industry and sort of seeing it change year after year. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's great. I mean, I think that it's true that that was all, that was all happening. You know, I remembered when blogs were first starting to kind of pick up speed and, you know, like you said, there was people who they had their own blog following and then magazines were like, okay, great. This person has X amount, you know, million viewers, people are, their readership is very high and people are visiting their website every day. How can we include them in our magazine or bring them in to maybe do like a special column or maybe we feature them or, you know, that kind of thing to kind of bridge that, you know, to, to bring people back and forth. And then it's funny, I've also seen going the other way, like I think that you had mentioned where people who worked in magazines, maybe they were an editor or, you know, a writer, a thing like that. And they decided to merge that into their own blog. And they just kind of would, you know, left the, the magazine entirely. There's been a, a big uh, kind of shift in all of that. And now it's, it's interesting because, you know, yeah, people can write you can publish your own articles in different spaces. You don't even have to be linked to a magazine per se. You know, you can kind of go about and do your own thing. So yeah, it, it's quite interesting. And now I feel as though we have so many different outlets, which is incredible. You can publish something on Medium. You know, you could publish something on LinkedIn. You can sort of kind of publish something on Instagram in a way, you know, of linking, oh, this is something that I did and then people can see it that way or Twitter, you know, there's just, there's so many different places I I feel for publishing and creating followers and readership and things like that. Yeah. 
Now let's I don't know kind if of answered your question. Well, no, it, it, it kind of did. I mean, and we'll you know we'll talk more about kind of that industry, especially when we look back kind of at what you were doing post college, like in the early parts of the two thousands. We'll talk mm-hmm. about that, but kind of switching gears here a little bit. Where did you grow up? Did you grow up in New York? No, so I grew up in Pennsylvania, in central Pennsylvania, in the capital called Harrisburg. A lot of people think, oh, I thought it was Philly or Pittsburgh, but uh, (laughs) nope. (laughs) Yeah, it's good old Harrisburg. So that's where I grew up. Yep. And was design kind of a big part of growing up? Were you exposed to it a lot? Not really. I mean, I think that I was one of those kids that wanted to do everything. I wanted to explore everything and, and try it out. There was, oh my gosh, it was like, art classes. There was the uh, Art Association of Harrisburg, which had all kinds of classes for geared for adults. And they had classes for children as well. So I took some art classes there and, you know, it'd be on Saturdays for probably an hour or two hours. And you did, you did things from pottery and painting and things like that. I also, you know, took dance classes. So I was a dancer and, and still continue to do that throughout my adulthood and piano. And there was gymnastics for a short period of time. So there was all kinds of things that I wanted to do. And, you know, you know, I was very grateful that, you know, my parents were supportive of all that, you know, even though they had to drive me to all these lessons and things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and then there were certain things where, they would say, hey, your piano lesson tomorrow, did you practice? I'd be like, oh, no, I didn't practice. And instead, I'd be like twirling a baton in the backyard for two hours. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was kind of all, all over the place and did all kinds of things. But design and art, I think, were always something that were a part of me and that I was interested in. And you uh, ended up going to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Talk to me about that experience. Yeah. So I graduated from yeah University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is kind of sort of connected, but it's its own school in itself from the University of Maryland College Park, where I was at University of Maryland College Park for my first year and a half. And then I transferred to the one to Baltimore County. And that was great. It was funny because when I had first started school and I, I wanted to be a, a veterinarian, And so that was something that I always wanted to do, even when I was in high school, that was kind of the career that I wanted to kind of go into. And so I started out kind of doing zoology and that sort of thing. And then I, Mm. but I always was into art and I was like, oh, but I wanted to see if there's a photography class I could take, you know, (laughs) so there was always like trying to find out where I could also have my art fix. And then after that, I was like, you know what, I think I want to do photography. So I transferred and went to UMBC, which is also University of Maryland, Baltimore County, for those Mm -hmm. that don't know. And yeah, and I studied visual arts there and did photography and minored in dance. So I was I was in heaven. (laughs) Why the shift? I mean, you said that you kind of wanted to get that art fix, but were you not able to get that if you were studying to be a veterinarian? Yeah, I think definitely I I could have gotten that art fixed. But I think the reality was, was that I was not as good at math as I should have been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that there was things where I was like, oh, calculus. Oh, I don't know. You know, and I I wanted to be stronger with that. So I was kind of like, maybe this should be a shift for me. So that's what I decided to change. Okay. I wonder if veterinarians use calculus. That's a good question. I, I'm curious because I studied math, like my degree <laughs> mm-hmm. is in math, and like I don't use calculus. <laughs> so I'm wondering why that would be something that a vet would have to know. That's a, Yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess maybe to get into like, you know, veterinarian school, like, things like that, I felt like there was the track that I needed to that I had to follow. And I thought that there were certain things that I needed to be strong at that I wasn't quite sure that I was. Yeah. In, so. What was your first job out of undergrad? Uh, my very first job was I was an intern at Oprah Magazine. Mm. And I was the photo, yeah, I was a photo intern there in their photography department. How was that? That was really awesome. <laughs> it was great. I worked with an amazing, talented group of people. Most of the staff was, there was a lot of women on staff. It was a great mix of age groups and women of color. And, you know, it was, it was amazing. I saw Gail King um, Mm -hmm. there every day because she was the editor at large at the time. 
and I did get to meet Oprah. I was going to ask. It was so- amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got to meet Oprah. She would come into the office every now and then and, uh, you know, and and kind of would pop in and and say hello to everyone. And I believe she came in twice during my time there. But I remembered the very first time she came there and I was just like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? What am I going to say? And it was Uh like. I just felt like she walked towards, it was like this light, you know, it was like this yeah. amazing sort of light and energy that was coming towards me. And I was like, wow, this, yeah, this person is, is amazing. So that was great. Yeah. What surprised you the most about Oprah? I don't know. I, I think that like the energy that she had was just exactly what I envisioned and what I kind of saw in the media or on television. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that she just had that energy. Okay. Yeah. Now, from looking at, you know, your work history, I mean, between 2001 and 2009, basically like all of the early aughts, you were working in visual content for a number of publications. You mentioned Oprah Magazine. You worked for W Magazine, for Vogue, for Gourmet. And like it's at this really interesting time where print and the web are, I don't know, I feel like competing in a way. Because I remember, so just like growing up in the 90s, like magazines were everything. I grew up in the deep south, and that was my connection to the rest of the world was Vibe and Source and Ebony and YSB and Emerge and all these magazines and stuff. Um, And I wanted to actually write for a magazine at some point. Didn't know how I would go about it, but I was always just kind of transfixed by the fact that like there were these really put together publications every month and it's ads and articles and just images and all this sort of stuff. But then the web came along and the web now made it very easy for you to publish kind of whatever you wanted to without any sort of gatekeeper, even if it was something very simple on like tripod or geo cities, right? Like something super simple. But then in the early two thousands, you've got the web starting to become more of a presence, particularly as it relates to journalism and publications and stuff. And so I don't know. Like, what was that time for you? Like, what was that like during that time when, like, the web is competing with print, but you're also working in New York City at all of these, like, major magazine brands? It was interesting because I think that I came into the magazine industry at a time where it was, like, was still in its height and it was strong and things were happening and there was so much excitement around it. Mm Mm-hmm. I remember too in high school and in college, you know, YSB, like, you know, the magazine you said, I'm like, oh my gosh, I used to love that magazine and vibe, you know, it it was such a cool thing because it's true. Like if you didn't live in a big city and and at that time, when I say big city, it's like, if you didn't live in New York or in LA, you know, you were kind of like, oh, I don't really know. I'm not like, I don't have my hand on the pulse. Like I don't really know what's happening. So It was like magazines were those things that kind of kind of helped link you to what was going on and like what was the fashion and what was people what were people listening to. And so when I started my journey with magazines, there was still that was all of that was still going on. But at the same time, there was the beginning of things were like even they were really starting to explode. Like everyone was like beginning to have their website and being like, okay, we need to move and extend this everything else online. But I think with magazines, it took a lot longer for publications in general, newspapers included. It took a lot longer for them to go into that, you know, and it was kind of like this, like, okay, well, we're still doing really strong. We still have a readership. People are still buying. So we're going to continue. You know, you felt that shift, but I, I feel like I didn't feel it in the beginning because things were still going really well. And, you know, advertising things were being sold and, and all of that. But, you know, as you got into like probably 2013, 2014, you know, it was more and more, you know, apparent that was just like, okay, if you don't have a website, you, like you're missing out. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, how, how can you not have a website? Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, the web took a lot of cues from print. I mean, in the early days of like just making layouts, everything was table based. And so, I think part of that reason was to add structure, but then we sort of figured out that you could layer design on top of that. Very similar, I would guess, to how you lay out a magazine in the old days. Like, 
So there's a lot of cues that the web took from print, particularly around like art direction of typography and images. It always seemed like the web was trying to like push beyond the boundaries of just the regular box model and try to deliver something that was more like a print experience, but online. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was definitely happening and I think continues to do so. And I mean, I think that's the thing with like design and and beautiful design and typography and the combination of imagery and that, like as humans, I think that we all, we respond to things that are well-designed and things that we can easily understand, you know, just by looking at really quickly. So that's why magazines were so, and are still, it's not like they're gone, but are still have that strength because there's so much that when you open up and you look at a double page spread of something and it's opening of a story and just like, wow, look how captivating the design plays with the words leading into the the copy and the photography and the the colors and and all of that stuff. So, so it was kind of, I think, you know, I, I definitely, yeah, it had to be a natural progression of kind of that going into the web and websites and and things like that, because otherwise it it was just kind of like, if you didn't have that element of design and that thought process going into web stuff, I think that you'd be missing out on a lot. It would just be like, Oh, here's a block. Here's text. Here's Mm -hmm. a block. Here's an image. And it it just, yeah. Would it be as interesting? So. Right. And speaking of what you said, it's, it's not even so much about the content as much as it is about the experience that you want to create for the reader, like, you know, double page spreads or even using like certain types of paper or certain sizes of magazines, you know, like I know in the, in the web industry, there's a, a number of different kind of bespoke, I don't know if I really call them magazines because they almost, the way that they're presented, it's almost like a digest as opposed to a magazine, just in terms of the size. So they're not your standard, like, I don't know what the dimensions are for like a broadsheet for a magazine, but like they tend to be smaller, squatter, thicker, almost not a book, but like somewhere between a book and a magazine. And so like with them, they're like designing the tactile experience with the size of the the magazine, the paper that it's using, the illustrations, et cetera. So you're like creating this whole experience that really you can't, you can't replicate that on a website, mm-hmm. you know? Exactly, exactly. And, you know, there's something too, like, yeah, it's it's the tangibleness, you know, something that you can hold, you can carry around, you can look at it, you can look at it again, you don't have to have the tab open, mm-hmm, <laughs> and then in paper mm-hmm. losing the tab, you know, so and things that you can, I have magazines that I've kept because of it's just like, wow, you know, the design, and this is just so beautiful. And this is just so elegant and yeah. and wonderful and things that I would over the years, I mean, I've definitely, I've stacks of, of different tear sheets and, and of inspiration, uh, notebooks and things from over the years, from things from Vogue, things from GQ, you know, things from Essence. I mean, all kinds of stories. So yeah, they're very inspiring. Yeah. yeah I just find them to be great snapshots of like, the world at that particular time. Like it's crystallized in this sort of tomb that you can go back to again and again and again to sort of see, well, what was life like back then? Or what were people talking about? Or what was the style back then? Because these magazines are geared towards the consumer. So all of that factors into what you end up getting as the end result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. What was it about time that made you decide to stay there so long? I just was really, I was very content. I was happy. I was working with a really great and talented group of people. And, you know, we were putting out really good work. When I started at Money, um, I was kind of like, I had did a lot of, you know, fashion and things prior to that. And I enjoyed the fashion, but I remember being like, oh, okay, I feel like I don't know anything about finance, (laughs) you know? And I was like, okay, what's the difference between this loan and this loan or, you know, 401k versus the Roth IRA and all of these different terms, right? We're Mm -hmm. kind of popping out and, but I was learning, you know, I was learning as I go and um, picking it up and and all of the, the writers and reporters and editors that I worked with were obviously so knowledgeable and it was really great. And as a creative there, the photo and art department, we really worked 
really well together and hard with creating visuals for, you know, a topic that some people don't find that exciting. No one likes talking about, you know, money or finance or savings. We took that challenge on, you know, every single month. And we were kind of like, okay, we have a story on paying for college. So how are we going to make this interesting? Let's figure this out. You know, and that was from take, it started from sketching, doing sketches. I would sit there and kind of think of an idea on how to kind of produce something to in a still life photograph that could illustrate paying for college. There was a lot of challenges, but I think that, you know, we put out some really beautiful, well thought out work that made a topic that isn't as sexy as fashion or Balenciaga, you know, mm-hmm. but we made it in, into something that was really, really interesting. And, and we did more things not just for still life. It was also, you know, a lot of portraits. We photographed professors and highly regarded people within the, you know, finance world. And we photographed families, you know, did personal finance stories on families and and people who were making changes or had a story to tell about their own sort of background. So. Mm. So when did you decide to go to SBA and get your master's degree? It sounds like this was a, a bit of a turning point for you in your career. Yeah, definitely was a turning point. I think for probably three years, three to four years before I decided to apply to the SBA Master's in Branding program, I would go to the website, I would look at it. I'm like, okay, I think I might be you know, interested in this. And so I thought about it for a couple of years and I was starting to see, not starting to see, but magazines, as we had talked about earlier, was shifting and the, the industry was changing. I'd been through a couple of magazine closures. I've experienced probably two to three folds of magazines where, you know, I was on staff and I had a job and then I didn't have a job anymore. So I was kind of like, okay, I, I need to figure out what my next thing is. Yeah. And then I decided to look into branding and brand strategy. And how was that process? I, so I know, I know Debbie. I know mm-hmm. Stephen. Actually, I got the. I met Stephen through AIG. That's a whole other thing. But I know that both of them can be very exacting in their <laughs> in their work because they've done this for you know decades and decades. But how was it going through that program? It was great. It was a really good experience. When I applied, I was kind of like, okay, you know, I think this could be really great for me. It's going to be an intense year. And when I met Debbie, I only knew a little bit about Debbie, and then when I got there and we, you know, we had our orientation and we had our, you know, first week and I, and I was like, wow, I was like this, I was like, this is awesome. I'm in a good spot, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and I was super excited. And yeah. And I think with any graduate program or school program you do, it's all about, you know, what you put into it is, is kind of what you get out. And I think with anything, yes, you can, you can put yourself into a, an environment that you're surrounded by great people and everything. But at the end of the day, you got to put in the work, you got to show up, you got to be a part of the team, you got to do the things, you know, you want to have your goals that you want to achieve. So I brought it every day. Some days, probably I was working on four hours of sleep because I was working full time, you know, at money and and, then doing in grad school. But it was a really, really, really incredible experience for me and a great program. And Debbie has been a, such an inspiration and, and great mentor for me even since uh, since graduating from the program three years ago. So very cool. So what prompted the move from New York to Denver? Yeah. So you know I was ready for a change. Um, I was living in. I've been in New York City for a really long time, and you know I had a couple of friends that lived here, some two really good friends from New York, a good friend that I went to college with. And so, you know, I'd come out here, I'd visit. I even did some work for Money Magazine. We'd have our Best Places to Live franchise. And one of the towns actually right next to where I live was number one, coincidentally, was number one, but that did not prompt my move at all. But but yeah, but I, you know, came out uh, several times and always had a good time. and And Yeah. So I was just like, you know what, I want to switch some things up and give it a whirl. And, you know, I kind of wanted to 
like quiet things down. And when I say that, I just think, you know, I just wanted to have things to be a little easier too, in, in a sense where New York was always so go, go, go. And you know that can take a toll, I think, after a long time. So I was just like, all right, I'm going to switch things up a little bit. So I went to Denver for the first time. I think I mentioned this uh, before we recorded, but I went for the first time last summer, honestly, on like a complete lark. I had only been to Denver as, as like a, I think I was a layover almost 20 years ago when I did an intern. Well, I interviewed for an internship at Microsoft and I had a layover in Denver going on the way to Seattle. And so all I really saw was the airport. I didn't get to see anything like about the city. And so I was looking for places to like go on vacation. And I'm like, Denver, I've never been to Denver. Like, <laughs> And the flight was pretty cheap. I was surprised how, how affordable the flight was from Atlanta. So I was like... Yeah, I'll give it a try. I'll visit. So I went out there for a week and Denver is so chill and relaxed. I guess, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily compared to Atlanta, but I could see myself like settling down and retiring in a city (laughs) like Denver. Like it's enough of a big city to be a big city. But then there's a very like just laid back, relaxed undercurrent to the whole city that I really, really like. Yes, it definitely, it definitely has the, the chillness, if you will. And I think like, you know, it's funny and I'm just a little bit outside of Denver. Um, I'm kind of in between Denver and Boulder mm-hmm. and it's even more so, I think it's kind of a perfect mix for what I need right now. And it's, it's, and it's been great. Yeah. Cause when I first moved, I was in Denver for a short period of time. Denver proper, but now where I am, it, it's great. You know, I, I can look out my window and I see the mountains to the left and the beautiful sunset every evening. And I can, you know, there's obviously uh, trails and hikes and things that are very, very close in distance. So yeah, it's a definitely a big difference from from New York City. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember I used to actually the company I used to work for was in New York and. I used to go to New York a lot for just pleasure. But then once I actually started going there for work, I hated it. I'm like, oh, New York is just so crowded. and Everyone's on top of each other. And it's, uh, I still like to visit New York. But if I have to do it for work, I'm always like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to hate New York because I will always love New York. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I do miss, I do miss parts of it. Uh, a lot of it. Got good friends there, obviously, still. And yeah. My there's always a piece of my heart is in Brooklyn and I appreciated my time there though for sure. Yeah. Was it a big jump to kind of go from working in visual content in the publishing industry for as long as you have to now being a strategist for a consultancy? Because that seems like a, a pretty big shift. Yes, definitely. It was a big shift. You know, I think with any time where people change industries and jobs, there's that big uncomfortable transition. And I think that I was kind of prepared for it, but then I didn't realize that like how big it was going to be. And, you know, yeah, it it was, it was hard because after doing something for a really long time and you feel as though you become a master at it and you're, you're comfortable in it. And I think also with magazines, it's interesting because that world is, is kind of small in its own, you know, so it's very, people change from one magazine to another. So a lot of times you may end up working with someone that you've worked with before, but at a different publication and things are just like a little bit different from one spot to another. But, you know, you kind of, you kind of could jump into it and, and, and start swimming quickly with the Mm -hmm. current where I think, you know, for me, you know, it was like, I jumped in and I was kind of like, okay, I can do this. Let me figure this out because it wasn't just figuring out a new industry, but it was also figuring out how the place that I was working works as well. So there, I felt like there was two things that I was, that I was navigating. So yeah, it was, it was a little hard, but with the transition, like I had did some freelancing before coming to egg. So I kind of had a little bit of some practice and and things like that. But then even when you go to a new, to a a new place, it's going to be different. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a learning curve and there's a lot of things that you kind of just have to like give yourself time and keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is it about strategy that appeals to you? You know, I think with strategy, it's finding, 
it's finding those things, those like exciting things that people aren't thinking about that can make their business or their idea a lot stronger. There's a whole process, you know, where you're kind of like, okay, well, what's, what's happening? What's missing? What do people need? Or what are they getting that they have already that's working? And so you want to find that niche that makes things, you know, you want to find that differentiator that they're kind of like, all right, this is why this is so important. Or this is why I need, like, someone's going to really dive into this idea or dive into this product or brand. So I first found out about you from this project that you're doing called the 100 Black Females Project. Can you tell me where the idea came from to do that? Yes. So I started the 100 Black Females Project during my time in the Master's in Branding program at SBA. And so part of the curriculum is that we have to do a project, a 100 days project. So it's doing something every day for 100 days and documenting it. The 100 Days Project was originally created by Michael Beirut, who is a graphic designer and professor, I believe, at Yale. And so, you know, he assigned this project to his students, his design students, and it became something that he gave to them to do for years. And so that's something that Debbie has also incorporated into the Master's in Branding program. So... In the spring semester, you figure out, you kind of figure out what you want to do for your 100 days project. And it's a process for everyone to kind of figure out where they want to go. For me, it started out where I was, you know, I was kind of like looking at myself, looking at who I am as a person. And, you know, one thing is that there was a lot of different things where I was kind of like, oh, I'm okay, I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm doing this graduate program, I live in New York City, you know, there's all different like things that make me who I am. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to also interview black women and girls and talk to them and find out their stories and figure out if there were things that they were had experienced that I also experienced growing up or, or in present day, And it was kind of a lot of like, you know, there was times where I felt that I wasn't, that I didn't fit in, or I felt odd about sharing my achievements because I don't like bragging about myself or, you know, all kinds of different things or how I felt about maybe going from getting hair relaxers to going natural and and all kinds of different things that I felt that I had a hard time talking about. Mm -hmm. And one of those things I think for a long time was talking about race and kind of calling out that I was different because I didn't want to be different. I just kind of wanted to like easily be accepted and easily kind of fit into the group, if you will. And so it was kind of like, huh, you know, I want to talk more about that. I want to ask other people if they have these same experiences. So that's kind of where it started was, was within the program. And now have you gone through and done a hundred black females yet for the project? Or are you still working on it? Yes. So I now have over, I'd say 215. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, in the beginning when I started the project, I was, I was thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to find enough people to, to interview and, and, and kind of and do this and, and, and document it and do it every day and post every day. But I was like, all right, well, it's a challenge. I'm going to see, I'm going to see how far it's going to go and, and where I'll get. And also too, I wasn't even, illustration wasn't something that I did that I thought of myself as doing. Photography was always my thing. So in the beginning, I was kind of like, oh, well, maybe I can do portraits. I'll shoot portraits of the people that I interview. But the fact that when I was I was in grad school and I was working full time, I barely had time to eat or sleep. Mm-hmm. So there was gonna I was like, there's not gonna be enough time for me to shoot portraits. So then I was like, all right, well maybe I can like do illustrate their portrait. So that's where that that started. And I was very nervous about doing that and sharing drawings that I wasn't that comfortable doing. But, you know, as I continued to do it and I kind of was like, 
found my my style and my way, and I, I just kind of continued going with it. And now, what sort of keeps you motivated and inspired with not just continuing with this project, but with your work in general? You know, the fact that I have created a space for Black women and girls to share their stories and to be an inspiration for others is motivation enough. You know, I when I started the project, I like I said, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to find, you know, 50 people, you know, or 100 people that would, would be want to do the project. And, and then as it kind of started picking up for me, and, and I was like, wow, like, I, I helped create this space in this place where people can share their stories and their thoughts and their experiences. And then it also, it's a place for non black women and girls, and you know, of other races to read and to learn. Mm -hmm. So I think that was also a a motivator, too. With everything that our world where we are right now, the stories of of Black women and girls, and it's very, very important. And it's time that people listen and learn and read. And the fact that that I have this space for that, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's motivating. Nice. When do you feel the happiest these days? Hmm. I think it's a mix. You know, I feel happiest when I'm kind of outside in nature, you know, doing walks and things like that. I also feel happiest when I'm creating art. So creating painting, drawings, things like that. And yeah, and then also, you know, being around family and friends. Hmm. So let's say there are people that are are out here listening who want to sort of follow in your footsteps, like maybe they're interested in strategy. What skills should they learn to kind of help get them started? Yeah, I would say that soaking in as much information as possible. And when I say that, I mean, like, as a strategist, like, it's not just about like, finding what's at hand, and kind of like taking in or like, oh, well, I did this research and I I found that this is what this person told me, or this is what I learned. It's much broader than that. I think that our culture and our world is, is such a big part of who we are as a society and who we are as people and where we're going and what we're, you know, learning and all of that. So I think that like, it's just kind of really like soaking in everything from things that you're reading from trends that are happening from the shifts that's happening in culture, the things that you're, that you're taking in. There's so many different places to, and ways to find information. And I think that that's the most important thing that it's not just one, it's not just one spot to get Mm -hmm. the answer. (laughs) Now, one question, you know, that I'm also asking everyone kind of this year is around kind of the theme of black futures and black futurism. So The question is, how are you using your skills to help build a more equitable future? Well, I think as a strategist, like basically remembering and bringing up Black culture, other cultures as well, and kind of how that is sometimes being forgotten in the work that we're doing. You know, I think that you kind of have to think about to society as a whole, it's not just kind of being like, oh, well, yeah, this, this is where a trend is because this is what we're seeing as this group. But then you're thinking, well, you know what? Not everybody, that's not a trend for everyone, you know, or might, that might be a trend, but not everyone is able to participate in that trend because there's different things that come into play. There's, you know, racial oppression, there's socioeconomic factors, there's all kinds of different things. So bringing all of that, you know, bringing equity and, you know, race and things to, to the forefront as something just as a lens to think through, I think is something that's very important to do to think of. Yeah, when it comes to strategy, where do you see yourself in the next five years? What kind of work would you like to be doing? You know, I think it's a mix of kind of strategy with a little creative like I said, you know, creativity and visual design, things like that have always been a part of me. So I think kind of merging, bringing those two things more together would would be great. So not quite exactly sure what that exactly looks like, but I'm sure it'll come 
clear into focus for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work and your projects and everything online? Yes. So everyone can follow the 100 Black Females Project on Instagram, and that's at 100 Black Females. And there's also a website that is 100blackfemales.com. So that's 100blackfemales.com. And yeah, both of those things can, you know, you can follow the project and see what's happening there and see what I'm up to and things like that. So. All right. Sounds good. Well, Shayla Hunter, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you really for kind of sharing your story. You know, I think it's really interesting how you had this full storied career early on working in one design industry and then did a sharp pivot into something else. Because I think it's important to show people, and I mentioned this to you before we started recording, but it's important to show people that there's more than one way that you can take your career in this industry. You can take the skills that you may have learned in one part of it and apply it to something else. And like with what you've done to be able to be around in those early days and really see the web and print, but then now move over into strategy, like that's a wealth of experience that you bring to the table, not just, you know, lived experience from being there, but also just the experience of knowing how trends change and how things shift. And so, you know, as we see a lot of things happen on the web, it almost feels a bit sometimes like history repeating, So you're able to kind of give a really good perspective on how this all works. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Big, big thanks to Shayla Hunter. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Shayla and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Are you looking for some creative consulting for your next project? Then let's do lunch. Visit us at yepitslunch.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. This podcast is hosted, created, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. So what did you think of this episode? Hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, or even better, by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I'll even read your review right here on the show. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.